This is the third talk in our Colloquium series on current issues in STEM education this semester. This series is part of the Barnard Noyce Teacher Scholars Program and is made possible by a grant from NSF. This evening I have the pleasure of introducing one of Barnard's own faculty members, Professor Jonathan Snow. Dr. Jonathan Snow, Assistant Professor of Biological Sciences, joined the faculty in 2012. He completed his undergraduate studies at Williams College and his doctorate in biomedical sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. Among his many notable accomplishments, he was the 2017 <coughs> recipient of the prestigious Emily Gregory Award for Teaching. Dr. Snow's research involves honeybees, which he keeps nearby on top of Barnard Hall. As many of you know, honeybee activity is crucial to both agricultural and ecological systems, but honeybees in the United States have been suffering from an increased rate of die-off in recent years. Tonight, Dr. Snow will be describing his own journey from biomedical scientist with a cellular focus to a honeybee biologist. He will also discuss the teaching challenges inherent in connecting the techniques and ways of thinking used in the study of cellular biology with broader issues of sustainability, such as honeybee disease and the growing pollinator <coughs> crisis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Snow. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for having me. Um, so this is a picture of Barnard, which you guys may recognize, and this is actually our bees over here on uh, the roof of Barnard Hall. And the title of my talk is, What Does Cell Biology Have to Do with Saving Pollinators? And I'm going to, just as uh, Lisa mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about kind of, kind of three things. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna be talking about cell biology, biomedical sciences, and my first direction as a biologist. And then I'm going to describe uh, why I switched to bees, but also just kind of a little bit about bees and, and uh, why we think they're important. And then I'm going to talk about uh, some efforts that I've been um, uh, currently trying to, uh, to take to, to get sustainability into a lab class that I teach, which is really a cell biology lab. And so how to kind of connect cell biology, which we usually think of uh, as being very focused and maybe having a sort of a biomedical uh, bent to it, Two, how can we sort of get sustainability as an idea into that kind of class? Um, so uh, I, I uh, will talk about some, some biology, cell biology a few times, and uh, I would welcome any questions during those times or any other times, so please stop me if you have questions or, uh, or other things you'd like to uh, ask about. So in order to tell you about bees and, uh, and why I study bees and how I want to incorporate them into cell biology, uh, I think it's, it's useful to think about uh, my own journey as a biologist and maybe even to sort of frame what biology is first. Uh, biology is kind of a continuum of different levels of organization. And this is one of the things that we teach in intro bio every time uh, you teach intro bio, just the idea that there are these different levels and that they're all sort of part of the continuum that is biology. And up here we have atoms and sort of more chemistry stuff, uh, molecules which are made of atoms, and then we start to get sort of higher levels of organization of these molecules into subcellular structures, and then cells, which is uh, arguably what, what I have been studying, and then those cells are going to be organized into things like <coughs> tissues uh, and organs, and then individuals, and the individuals go on to make up populations, ecosystems, etc. And uh, one of the things I really like about biology is this, the fact that it's such a broad continuum of sort of disciplines and that the challenge is always to uh, both focus on one aspect of that because you can't know it all, but also to sort of keep in mind the big picture of this continuum. And uh, this is actually the Wikipedia definition of cell biology. And uh, that is the level that, that uh, you know, I focused on and that I focus on in my teaching. And it's defined as the branch of biology that studies the different structures and functions of the cell. But I think inherent of that is uh, those subcellular components that make up the function of the cell, but also then how does the cell 
uh, give rise to these more complex things that maybe we're, we're more interested in. One of the things that I thought was really interesting uh, in that definition, uh, so this is a, a part that was a little bit farther down the page, knowing the components of cells and how cells work is fundamental to all biological processes. It is also essential for research in biomedical fields such as, such as cancer and other diseases. So I found it interesting, and I think this is sort of gets to some of the challenges that I have, that cell biology, even in its definition, its general definition on Wikipedia, is immediately associated with questions of medicine and human health. And, and I don't think that's, a, that's an incorrect association, but what happens is then it's hard for us to imagine it uh, uh, being involved or being uh, uh, essential for understanding other aspects of biology, like the environment. Okay, so this is uh, a picture of me uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, looked a little different then. Uh, so when I was an undergraduate at, at Williams, uh, I became really fascinated with cell biology and just as the definition says, I was really interested in understanding how does cell biology and molecular biology, how does that play into human disease? How can understanding how humans work at the cell biological level, how can that help us understand uh, disease? Uh, and after I graduated uh, from there, I went on to study just that. And I, and I focused on uh, the process of blood development. So this is uh, just a schematic of blood development. And the basic idea behind blood development is that we all have lots of different blood types, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. They have to get made all the time, and that's a complex process. So this is that process. But I was really interested in understanding it at the sort of uh, cell molecular level. So how do different processes in the cell really contribute to uh, the correct generation of these blood types? Uh, but also, how can processes going wrong actually contribute to disease? And so that's what I did for approximately 15 years. And I studied specifically, and this is just really uh, hardcore cell biology images looking at signal transduction, so how cells are actually sensing things in their environment, and then how cells are responding to cells to things in their environment through changes in gene expression. So the idea is that it's really sort of cell biological approach to, to a, a biomedical science problem. So this is what I was doing during my PhD work and during my postdoc work. Um, and mostly I was working with cell lines and mouse models. So, so again, the kind of things that you would expect to be employed looking at uh, trying to understand human disease. Okay, so, so why did I uh, switch to bees? Uh, so I, I'm in my postdoc, I'm doing this biomedical work. Obviously, uh, human disease didn't get less important, right? Uh, but I started to sort of change my overall focus. And it actually happened um, just through interests of my own, starting to get into uh, agriculture and food production. I co-taught a class on the American food system with a friend of mine at Tufts uh, University. And it was through that process that I started a sort of continuing journey uh, with wanting to better understand how we make our food, how our food system uh, is set up here uh, in the United States and how food systems uh, in modern times are set up but also to understand how the organisms uh, that are involved in those food systems are employed. And um, it was during that time that I actually uh, took a beekeeping class and, uh, and I just basically fell in love with bees immediately and sort of never looked back. So I, um, uh, there's a couple of things about bees that made them especially good to be a model. Um, we, don't know a lot about them at the cell molecular level, so it seems like a perfect place for a cell molecular biologist to get involved. Uh, at the time, they were really undergoing sort of a crisis. Uh, there was a lot of concern about pollinators and how they were doing. Uh, and the other thing is that there were a couple of tools uh, that were already available. So we, we had the genome sequence for honeybees, so that just automatically put some tools in the hands of somebody who's a cell biologist. And then uh, finally, we do know a lot about some other insects, specifically the fruit fly, the Sophilum melanogaster. So that way we we're gonna have like a place to start off in trying to, uh, to understand bees. Okay, so 
Now I'm just going to give you my sort of like spiel about bees and why we care about them. Um, and probably when you ask most people, this is why they think we care about bees. Who, who likes honey in this room? All right, who, who doesn't like honey? It's okay. There's always some people. They don't you usually like to raise their hands, but that, that's fine. Uh, okay, so most of people think about bees benefits as being that they provide us with honey and, and certainly honey tastes really good on toast. I've found that as a beekeeper, if I don't have honey in my office, then people don't actually think I'm a beekeeper. So it's sort of a badge of authenticity as well. You have to be able to sort of pull out a jar of honey and show people and be like, yeah, this is, this is for my bees. Uh, so that's important. <laughs> but. Um, and I will tell you that Manhattan honey actually turns out to be really good, despite uh, your expectations. But um, it turns out that really the most important thing that bees do for us uh, as humans is pollination, the pollination services that they provide. So uh, this is uh, showing uh, honeybees on the cherry tree on uh, Riverside Drive, and this is clover in Central Park. And basically as bees fly from flower to flower, uh, they transfer pollen from flowers of, of the, uh, between flowers of the same species, and this allows for the plant to complete its reproductive cycle, uh, which is absolutely important or absolutely critical for lots of different plants. And over millions of years, certain plants and pollinators like bees have co-evolved uh, to be able to uh, provide these mutually beneficial uh, services to each other. And it turns out that bees are important in, in natural ecosystems some honeybees are, but they're even more important in agricultural ecosystems, and especially the agricultural ecosystems that we've set up uh, over the last 50 years. So uh, there are lots of plants uh, in our agricultural system that absolutely require bees. Uh, so this is one of them, almonds. You can see here we've got uh, almond fields in Central Valley in California. It's just almonds, miles and miles and miles of almond trees that look just like this. So we need to have a pollinator that we can bring in during the time that the almonds are flowering. We can pollinate all the almonds in the spring, probably right now actually, and then we can take all those pollinators and truck them back out of the almond field. So we need that kind of pollinator. And honeybees are really the only uh, pollinator that can do that uh, because they have 30,000 approximate individuals in a colony. Uh, they don't mind being moved around that much, uh, and they're generalist pollinators, meaning that they will pollinate many different types of plants. So they can be brought into many different agricultural settings and uh, do, uh, do pollination services. So almonds are the type of plant that really requires that we have honeybees. There's lots of other uh, things that we like to eat that probably don't essentially require honeybee pollination, but you get a lot better uh, yield when you have honeybees uh, that are able to pollinate this, uh, these plants. And so this is some examples of those apples, blueberries, peaches. So in these, with these plants, what we're really thinking about is the fact that uh, we can increase the yield by bringing the, the honeybees in to do those pollination services. And it's estimated that probably one out of every three bites that we eat is in some way uh, been impacted by honeybee pollination. Okay, so does that mean that without bees, only gruel? Uh, probably not. Um, but I think uh, a lot of the things that we really like to eat in our current way that we're doing agriculture really require honeybee pollination. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about other pollinators and especially other bees and how I think uh, they're also really important and don't maybe get the press that uh, honeybees do. Okay, so uh, as our agricultural system has gone more into these kind of monoculture uh, uh, crop systems where you have just one flowering type of flowering plant growing in a, in a large swath, uh, that has increased our dependency on honeybees. And uh, that's also turned out to, to be not uh, that good for bees. Because what that means is that we have to bring the bees to those almond orchards. Those are only going to flower for two to three weeks. And then there's nothing else for the bees to eat there, so you have to move them. You have to move them, if you're trying to make money doing this, you have to move them somewhere else where you can be paid to bring in your, bee, uh, your beehives. 
So uh, that means that a lot of the agricultural bee pollination services are done by really large beekeeping operations. Uh, this is an estimate that over 80% of the country's 2 million hives are in commercial migratory beekeeping operations, and they might exceed 10,000 hives in one of these businesses. So bees in a typical year in one of these commercial operations are gonna be trucked all around the country in order to provide these services. So this is a picture of a 18-wheeler uh, with bees loaded up. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the reports when one of these turns over on the highway. I mean, it happens two or three times a year that you just get one of these turnover and you got the firemen out there trying to corral, you know, millions of bees. But if you can imagine bees being trucked over to the Central Valley in California and then South Dakota and then maybe Maine uh, to hit blueberries and then Florida, you can imagine that this is probably not a very uh, comfortable life for really any animals, but especially not bees. This, is, uh, this kind of industrial beekeeping practice is very stressful for bees. Not only the traveling, but also the way that they are sort of uh, put into these very dense uh, apiaries where things like disease can really spread uh, very rapidly. Okay, so it actually got so bad uh, in, the, in the middle 2000s that there actually started to be cases of bee rustling. So and that's, that's not a joke, that, that really happened. So people would go show up in the middle of the night, load up other individuals' colonies onto a trailer, and drive them somewhere where they could get $80 per hive uh, to leave them there for two or three weeks. So it, was, uh, it, it got uh, pretty crazy there, uh, especially during the, the colony collapse disorder, which I'm not really gonna talk about um, so much, but the, the crisis that the bees were facing. So uh, some bee rustling strategies were actually better than others, uh, and this one actually is no longer used because it just wasn't, uh, wasn't that effective. All right, that's, I love that joke, but. <laughs> okay, so, um, so this was, as I alluded to, this, uh, this kind of uh, demand and supply and demand mismatch uh, was especially, or was exacer uh, exacerbated by uh, decreased honeybee health. And in around 2006, uh, there was something called colony collapse disorder, which was a syndrome that was affecting honeybees. And uh, that uh, has appeared to, as a syndrome has passed, but uh, the survival of bees has never really recovered. So uh, pre-2000, the historical survival was about 80% of, um, of colonies made it every year. Uh, but what's happened over uh, since 2006 is that we've had a 20% a decrease or 20 percentage point decrease from those, uh, those percent colony survivals of the pre-2000 era. And that's never really recovered, even though the syndrome colony collapse disorder apparently is not happening anymore. So what's causing uh, the decreases in honeybee health? Um, well, it's gonna be kind of a who's who of environmental problems. Um, and it's probably kind of one of those death by a thousand cuts scenarios where we have complex <coughs> interacting stresses which are causing the bees uh, to have trouble surviving through the winter. So some of the things that are probably contributing or uh, decrease in the quality or quantity of forage, obviously as we have uh, uh, urban centers growing or industrial sort of monocultures in agriculture growing, that's gonna reduce uh, the good forage uh, or available foodstuffs. There's uh, novel pathogens that have been uh, sort of passed around the world as globalization has uh, increased and uh, chemical poisoning, which can be anything from sort of acute toxicity problems to maybe sublethal effects of pesticides that are, um, that are being more and more uh, widely used. And then also, just as I pointed out, the industrial beekeeping practices. So just, just doing that stressful aspect of keeping bees in dense bee yards or trucking them around the country is probably stressing them out. And you get a combination of these things uh, and, uh, and it starts to really weigh on the bees. So um, I do have to point out, again, that's all very important, but as I sort of alluded to when I talked about taking the, the beekeeping course, uh, I've just sort of uh, decided that I just love thinking about honeybees, and as I'll tell you a little bit later, 
about, uh, about native bees, other types of bees as well, uh, because they're just uh, pretty fascinating. Okay, so, so I made the switch to bees. I've uh, told you why I think bees are important. Um, so what is it that I actually study in bees? So what we study in our lab now is cell stress and infectious disease in honeybees. And we're interested in two really broad questions. The first is, how do bees respond to stress? And we talked about a couple of those types of stressors on the last slide. How do they respond to stress at the cellular level? So what are the cellular mechanisms that they're employing to respond to stress? And with the assumption that those cellular stress responses will impact the, the overall organism or the individual. And then we're also interested in how uh, the cell, or how a certain parasite of honeybees called Nosema serrani how does it respond to similar stresses at the, at the cellular level? So uh, understanding both of those things, we're hoping will help us to uh, contribute something into understanding uh, honeybee health and how we might be able to, uh, uh, to make them healthier overall. Okay, so what we have, the cellular process that we focused on is called proteostasis. You guys uh, uh, don't need to uh, learn all of this, but just as sort of a reminder, what proteostasis is, or is the, uh, the synthesis, folding, and function of proteins. And, and all you need to know about proteins is that most of the jobs that our cells do are done by proteins. So making proteins in your cells is really important. And this is the process that makes proteins. You don't have to worry about this process, but just trust me when I say that this is the process that makes proteins. And it's, uh, it's a really complicated process. Uh, that can be impacted uh, negatively by lots of different stresses. Uh, so what kind of stresses can impact this process? Well, uh, this is actually uh, kind of a, a pretty dense figure, but what I want you to think about is really just, just the things that are on the outside, the, the last or the outermost ring of this, uh, of this graphic. And these are the things that people know affect proteostasis or the synthesis folding and function of proteins. So some of the things that you might see up there, xenotoxicity, that basically means chemical poisoning. Uh, genetics, microbial infection, nutrition, aging, some, some physiological stress, which you might imagine uh, might occur when you're trucking bees around. Uh, so these are all represent some of the things that we thought uh, were important in uh, contributing to decreases in honeybee health. And they're all known for through lots of different models and lots of different systems to affect proteostasis. So that's what we've studied, and it's it's uh, it's been really interesting because it's again it's allowed me to kind of have the bees and then do this really cell biology intensive uh, work on the bees. And you know even in my research, trying to kind of span that cell biology approach to the health of individuals that live in colonies of 30,000 is kind of a challenge and is uh, constantly requiring uh, thought. But I think that gets back to that biology continuum, right, where we've got a lot of different levels of organization of biology, and you've got to try to, to kind of think about as many of them as possible to really understand what's happening in living things. Okay, so lastly, what I'm going to be talking about is what does cell biology have to do with saving pollinators? Not so much, but how can, uh, how can we uh, think about connecting cell biology and broader issues of sustainability in uh, classes? Uh, for me specifically, because I teach, and I'm gonna talk about this, I teach uh, classes that are really about cell biology, and that's what I'm supposed to be teaching. So how can I try to bridge the information in those classes with sort of broader themes of sustainability. Because what I found is that it, it isn't really a natural fit. Uh, it's not the first thing you think of when you try to design these classes. It's not the first thing that students think of uh, when they take these classes. Okay, so just a reminder that we've got our, our sort of biological levels of organization. And if you ask people in my department what kind of biologist I am, they will say cell biologist, I think. Is that right? That's one of the things you might say. Be nice, right? So, um, so 
Cell biology, that's the level that I focus on. And I teach three classes here, primarily, and they're all sort of focused on that level of biological organization. So one of them is the intro to cell and molecular biology, and that's really a kind of survey course looking at introductory biology at the level of organization of the cell and sort of below the cell. So then I teach an upper level lecture on cell biology, and that is, um, uh, the way that I have uh, framed that course is that we look at how cells function, it's for upper level students, and then also think about how that can go wrong in uh, progression to cancer. So we've really framed that in sort of a, a medical context. And then the final class that I have is a laboratory in cell biology. And in that class, we're looking at, at cell biology, we're looking at how you might approach understanding cell biology in a lab context. So uh, in a doing kind of context where you're trying to actually figure out things about how the cell works. Um, so a sort of a backdrop to um, this question of how can I get sustainability back into, um, uh, back into this class. Uh, I was on the Sustainable Practices Committee here at Barnard, and one of the things that we did this year is we had, we had uh, five conversations where we had the whole community was welcome to come and talk about uh, a sort of broader sustainability vision for Barnard College. And uh, these are, the, oops, these are the, uh, the workshop titles, but one of them is curriculum and research. And the idea is that you know, we have uh, many classes here. Some of them are, have nothing to do with sustainability. Some of them, uh, like the environmental sciences department, have everything to do with sustainability. But how could we take all the classes and think about the ones where sustainability could be talked about or where there were links to sustainability so that we could make that sort of an, an undercurrent of the uh, overall educational mission here at Farner. And uh, sort of participating in this process um, uh, has kind of helped me to think about how I can do that. Uh, in addition, um, well, so that, that's what kind of has preparing for this talk, thinking about how I can improve the, the class, but also kind of the backdrop of having this as a, as a mission for this committee that I'm on has helped me to sort of think about uh, how I wanted to go about this. Okay, so this is, so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna show you is, I'm gonna sort of tell you about what the class is right now. So before I've made any changes. Uh, and then I'm gonna tell you about some of the strategies that, that I've come up with that I hope are going to really help make this connection between cell biology and pollinators. Not, not for me, because I already kind of know the, the connections, but for the students to try to get this kind of in their consciousness. Okay, so this is a, a sort of abbreviated description of the course. Pur pursue cell biology through weekly lab exercises. We're gonna learn some cell biology techniques. Um, and this is all really important, right? The class has to do these things because we're teaching the students about uh, laboratory aspects of cell biology, of thinking about the cell, of learning about the cell. So this, this kind of has to stay the same. Uh, what we've done, or what I've done so far, is I've used a cell line from the fruit fly to examine uh, these aspects, so to examine cell biology. So that means we're using a cell line to sort of think about, uh, as our system, to sort of think about cell biology. Okay, so we have, um, and this will start to bring things back, so uh, what we've looked at is something called the unfolded protein response, which is related to proteostasis, that whole concept of making proteins and make sure they're, making sure that they're functioning correctly. So that's kind of what we focused on. So we focused on a very small slice of cell biology. Um, and the other kind of important thing I think uh, in terms of, uh, of the class structure is that we have a four week long independent project at the end. So this is uh, a point where the students can uh, take what we've, what we've learned about interrogating and learning about cell biology and sort of apply it to uh, a question um, at least partially of their own uh, devising. So sort of allow them to, to stretch their legs a little bit uh, with what they've learned. Okay. So again, you know, before I came up with this idea of trying to get the sustainability in, you know, I was hired and I had to come up with a class, right? So 
this is what I did, and you'll see that it, it relates directly with my research interests, okay? So this is what I showed you earlier about uh, the parts of, of kind of real world biology that are going to impact that cell biological process of proteostasis we have down here. One of the things, if you look in this sort of middle uh, or second to outer ring, do you see that, that pathway, that acronym that I, that I mentioned in the last slide, the unfolded protein response? So what, what I've done is I've focused on a very small slice of biology, that being the proteostasis aspect, and that's part of what we do in my lab, right, is think about that process of making proteins and making sure they function. But we also know that, um, you know, sort of as a backdrop, that all of the things that we think are potentially uh, important uh, in honeybee health are impacting that. I'll also tell you that proteostasis is something that, that has been very recently uh, identified as very important in human disease. So if you think about um, different diseases, oh, yeah, let's see, there we go. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this and then I'll go back. There's a lot of diseases that are actually directly related to dysfunctions or problems in proteostasis. So here's some examples. Uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, mad cow disease, uh, amyloidosis, some others. But there's a lot of, a growing list of diseases that we know are related to proteostasis. And again, if we think about what it is that we usually think cell biology is, is for, it's kind of got that medical aspect. Okay, so let's, let's go back uh, to this. Um, Okay, so we, we know we have the broader picture of what can impact this cell biology process. We know one of the pathways or one of the processes that's involved is this unfolded protein response. So this is the unfolded protein response, and you guys should not worry about uh, really thinking about this in, uh, in a lot of detail, except to understand that this is how a cell understands there's something wrong with me in terms of proteostasis. This is one of the ways that the cell says, something is not right in my proteostasis process. And you know, these, this, all this sort of circuitry uh, of this pathway have been worked out through many years of experimentation and it's somewhat complex, but the idea is that the cell senses that there's a problem, oops, senses there's a problem, sends some signal inside, inside of the cell, and then tries to change something to respond to that problem. Because cells in general, they want to sense a problem and then figure out a way to bring themselves back into a normal functioning scenario. So what we've done is we've really focused just on this very small process and this small slice of this process in the class, which I, which I thought has been really valuable because the amount of cell biology that we actually have to learn for the class is actually uh, not, very, not very great. But the different ways of interrogating the cell biology, the different ways of thinking about it, we've actually been able to look at uh, lots of different things. So just as a, uh, to go back, this is what our model is. It's, uh, it's the cell line, uh, it's uh, from the fruit fly, it grows in a dish, this is what it looks like. Uh, so this is pretty far from pollinators, right? You guys may have already started to be like, I forgot what we were talking about earlier on in the talk. Because this is pretty far uh, pre-separated from uh, that whole set of biology. And then again, I, I told you that, um, that UPR and proteostasis has a lot of connections with uh, medical, uh, medical issues. And in the past iterations of the class, that's kind of what we focused on. We, we used this insect cell line. We looked at a very small uh, aspect of this cell biology, but we really thought about it as its connections to medicine. And that's in part been because that's you know, what I am used to thinking about, used to teaching, but also because I think that's a little bit of what the students are expecting. Uh, most of the students who are coming through these three classes that I teach are thinking about health-related careers. And so this is a, an attractive connection for them. And I don't think it's a, it's, it's a bad connection. It's, it's natural and it's important. Like We're all affected by human disease, right? So it's something that we all care about. Okay, one of the nice things about the flexibility of using this cell line is that there's a lot of tools already available. So people already know a lot about it, and they know a lot about how this 
unfolded protein response functions in cells. So what that means is that we can look at this small, you know, this is all the biology is in this box. That's all we're learning in terms of biology. But we can look at it from at different levels in order to better understand how it works. So we can look at the signaling level, we can look at the response level down here, we can look at cellular outcomes. So what do the cells actually do when they respond? How do they actually uh, recover or try to recover? Okay, so again, that's, that's what we've done. Uh, but there's really no connection with sustainability in the class as it currently is taught. Uh, it's all about biomedicine, you know, I come in, I, I work with bees, and then that's really the last time we talk about bees unless maybe we get some kind of connection with, um, uh, with, um, with the independent projects. Okay, so I just want to, if I can, remind you guys that at this point, of course I'm still interested in medicine, but I'm also interested in just this magical entity known as the honeybees. So this is just a slow-mo video I took uh, a few weeks ago. Whenever it gets warm enough for them to start coming out in the spring, I get really excited, even though it also means that my allergies are gonna kick up. Um, and I go up there, and the first days that they're out, you know, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. So this is just, just sort of trying to capture that idea. That this, is, this is a real living thing that's doing amazing things. And then unfortunately, that seems, it feels a little bit lost uh, when I'm teaching the cell biology class. So how can we try to get that back in there? Okay, so if you think about the biology continuum that I talked about, it actually really shouldn't be that hard to do it. Okay, so we have our cell lines and uh, the cells are just growing in a dish and they sort of look like little balls, little grapes. Uh, but we know that those are organized into tissues and this is actually uh, showing uh, uh, the gut of a honeybee and these are cells that are kind of making up the epithelium of the honeybee gut. We know that the tissues and organs, even in an insect, are all going to contribute to the, the ability of that individual to function. And that when we think about bees, we have individual bees that all live together in a colony and help promote uh, the success of that, of that group. So uh, what I did is I tried to come up with a number of strategies that I'm going to try next year to try to get uh, sustainability into this class. And I think it's actually not going to be that hard. Um, but we'll see. And I, and I think it'll actually maybe even make me like the class more, which is, uh, is going to be great. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to change the framing a little bit. So I'm actually going to frame the class in terms of pollinators and honeybee health, uh, or bee health. So if you think about it, uh, you know, the first day of class in a general class, what happens? Syllabus, we kind of talk, well, what's the big picture? What are we talking about? Yeah, you guys signed up for the class, but you kind of didn't think about it again until the first day, right? Right? Probably. So, so this is my chance to sort of say, this is what the class is going to be about. So I'm going to try to frame the class in terms of pollinators and honeybee health. Uh, I'm not going to leave out that medical connection totally. I'm just going to change when I talk about it. So I'm not going to lead with that. Okay. I think we're going to also try to begin the, the, the class with a first day trip to see the bees. So instead of just starting with cells, we're actually going to go up and see bees for the first day. Uh, so that means that we can see organisms, real organisms, uh, in their natural environment. You know, if it's rainy, you know, we'll, we may have to work something else out. We can bring an observation hive in, something like that. Uh, the other thing I'm hoping to do is incorporate some original research from my lab, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, so use some, some readings that we have that, uh, where we've done it in, in our lab. So instead of just doing readings from mostly other, other groups that have, have studied this process, <coughs> try to incorporate more readings uh, with undergrads as co-authors into the lab. Um, and then also start with cell biology experiments using bees. Try to use whole organisms to do cell biology, which is possible, before focusing in and getting to that, that cell line uh, level. And then finally, sort of encourage students to think about the big picture when they're doing their final project. So a lot of times uh, students will sort of, at some point during the semester, they say, so, so why are we doing these, this again? The big picture is, you know, this is gonna help us learn about human health. And 
there are probably better ways to learn about this in, with human health than using like an insect cell line, right? So to try to like help them see that, that I'm trying to get us to, to maybe solve uh, some different kinds of issues. Okay, so framing the class, you know, I think what I have to do there is I really just have to give sort of a similar spiel as I did today, right, about why we care about bees, what they do for their environment, the kinds of issues or stresses that they're facing. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I really like about studying bees is that I'm much more interested in flowers now, so I'm always taking pictures of flowers and bees uh, all the time. Okay, so apiary tour. This is actually something that um, I'm asked to do a lot. I'm asked to take people up to see the bees a lot. So we'll just uh, sort of split up into some groups. And sort of the first experiment is just to go up and look at some bees. Uh, we'll see what they're up to. We'll observe them walking around, flying around, doing the things that they like to do. Okay, so that's, uh, that's something that I think will kind of help give some context at the organism level to the cell biology. Incorporating original research. Uh, as I mentioned, we already study proteostasis, that, that process of protein folding and function. We already study that in our lab. And in fact, we've had some, uh, some great undergrads work in the lab who have uh, been co-authors on publications where we have characterized some of this stuff in bees. And we don't we need to go over that, but that means that we have some publications that we could put into the beginning reading list for the class. The first things we're gonna read some, you know, some mechanistic things about how this cell biology works, but then try to immediately get back to how does this connect to, to bee biology and pollinator health. Uh, and in fact, we actually have uh, a manuscript in preparation where we are actually doing some of the same kind of experiments that we typically do in the lab class. So it would be really nice to kind of have that, them do that in parallel with reading a, a, a manuscript where we're actually doing those things trying to figure out about how this works in bees. And again, I think starting experiments with real organisms um, is, you know, doing experiments with organisms is something that, that biologists like to do, so you know, not everybody likes that. I understand that, but you know, having the ability to kind of see the real organism and do experiments with them before kind of getting into that real focused aspect of just looking at cells. This is, this is actually, we capture bees using these aspirators. And then uh, people are always sort of shocked that that's how we do it. There's a little, there's a little mesh here so you, don't, uh, you won't suck it into your uh, throat. So it's totally tip. Okay, but I actually want to make a final, in the final minutes I want to kind of make another pitch which is that maybe we should even be going a little bit farther. That honeybees may be sort of the gateway to like broader sustainability issues. So when I usually talk to students, they are sort of under the impression that there's two types of bees, honey and bumble. Uh, that is not true. There are in fact over 20,000 species of bees on the world, in the world. 4,000 of them are here in North America, and this is actually a poster that I have outside my office showing a small subset of the bees you might find in North America. Uh, a really diverse group of individuals. And they're all involved in pollination. Uh, and the relative importance of them is going to depend on the ecosystem, but they're all involved in pollination and probably contribute to that service that we, that we need, but also that ecosystems need. And just as we can kind of imagine that honeybee health has been decreasing, it turns out that similar decreases in the health of all these other bee species when they've been studied has also been noted. Okay, so this is uh, from a review this is looking at a bumblebee, Bombus affinis. And the black uh, region here shows its historical uh, zone. So where did it, or its historical range. So where has it typically been found uh, over time? And then this sort of lighter gray is showing the range, the current range. So the range has shrunk. But even more troubling is that these were all of the observations during that time. So not only was, were they only observed within this gray range, but it wasn't like they were seen all over that gray range. So we've actually seen a decrease in the range of this bumblebee species and probably a decrease in the number of the species overall. And that's probably true for most uh, bee species and actually maybe most insects. So 
Uh, the causes are likely the same ones that are impacting honeybee health. Forage quality decrease, novel pathogens, chemical poisoning, and industrial beekeeping practices. And what I mean by that is it turns out that honeybees are probably not that great for native bees or wild bee species. So while I am certainly never gonna abandon the honeybee, it's important to think about you know, how they're impacting these other species and how the health of these species are sort of being impacted in parallel to the honeybees, which get, of course, get a lot of press. So do we have native bees around here? Yeah, this is a, a picture of a bumblebee that my wife took on uh, Barnard's campus last summer. And um, so one of the things that I'm thinking is, you know, maybe that same day that we have the apiary tour, maybe we can go up to our very own little wild bee range up here on the Diana Green Roof and actually see if we can see some native bees to sort of, again, like increase the context, not just honeybees, which I agree are the best, but these other bees too. Like, can we like see some? Can we like actually see some in their uh, wild environments? And then uh, uh, another uh, professor in our department showed me this, this really cool crowdsourcing website called iNaturalist. And I uploaded the picture and I found out that this bee is a brown belted bumblebee. Uh, I didn't know that. I don't know a lot about native bees, which is one of the reasons I'm kind of interested in this. Uh, but what this implies is that not only could we maybe uh, do our own sort of bee hunt uh, during that first day to help provide context, but we'd actually do a really simple identification uh, test just to see what's out there on that day in September. Um, so that's another way that I'm kind of hoping to kind of increase uh, increase the, uh, the sustainability broader than just this really uh, important familiar species uh, to us, uh, the honeybee. So I want to just end on some kind of some themes that I think uh, that I think are important, and then you know I'd like to you know take some questions if, if you guys have any. So one of them is I think that biology is really important to recognize that biology is a is a continuum of different levels of organization, and that they're all sort of dependent on each other for a full understanding of biology. And that's one of the things I love about biology. Uh, another thing, which you guys probably knew already, is that bees are critical pollinators, and that they need our help. And I think that's something that's uh, important. And, um, and then finally, the idea that maybe honeybees can be sort of a charismatic megafauna or surrogate species for us getting a little bit more attention to other to bees, other bees, like these native bees that I was talking about, and maybe invertebrates more broadly. So can we use bees, or can I specifically use bees, as a way to help get people thinking about some of these other species and how important they are? Okay, so um, with that, I'd just like to thank uh, my lab, uh, uh, Barnard, and then uh, Lisa for inviting me to speak, and then I'd love to take any questions. just teach it in the fall, wow. which is, is kind of one of the things, like, you know, I would love to do independent projects at the end of the fall with bees, but they're pretty much, they're done at that point. Uh, so we could probably do it, but they would not like it. <laughs> and that would mean that, that I would get stuck. So. <laughs> Yeah, so they, they've actually got this thing where when they, like on a given day, they pick a flower and they just sort of stick to that for a certain amount of time. And obviously there's, they stop doing that and go to another flower at some point, but they are, are kind of faithful once they pick a flower to pollinate. And that's, that's really important for them to be efficient pollinators because um, you know, obviously taking pollen from species A to species B would not be Once you uh, like release the bees to like a field, a specific, specific field that you're like, pollinate, how do you 
how do they kind of wrangle all the beats back onto the truck to kind of bring them to the next place? Yeah, so so we, we move bees uh, sometimes, and one of the things you realize about bees is you can't worry about every last one, because uh, you'll never get them all in the box. So what you do is you wait till it gets dark, and then you kind of close them up, and probably 99% of them are in there at that point, because they all come back and kind of keep warm together and try to keep the young warm uh, at night. So it's a pretty good bet if you just close them up at night that most of them will be in there. Is there something attached to the uh, I mean, it's 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 like their relatedness to the queen and the and the other bees. I mean, they're so all the work. So the bee colony is made up of three types of individuals. So uh, the queen is the reproductive female, and then you have a sterile females, which um, are the workers, and they basically do all of the important jobs. And then you have the males, uh, which mate with queens from other colonies. Um, but the most important bee for the day-to-day -day function is the worker bee. But they're sterile, so they don't give rise to progeny. And so their ability to pass on their genetics to the next generation is totally dependent on them helping the queen to produce more bees. So they are, are programmed to come back uh, to help their colony. Well, I, one of the things that I think is, is also important about biology is just as easy as I can, I mean, not, not that it was totally easy, but just as easy as I can go from studying blood development to studying bees, all the things that we're going to learn about the cells are totally transferable, I and mean, they're totally going to be the same in human cells, you know, mostly. So that kind of transferability of cell biology is really important. So it's not like they're going to they're gonna lose out on their cell biology, it's just going to be how we're going to frame it, and the idea that we're going to include aspects that we haven't currently thought about in the class. And it, you know, I'm gonna include the reading about the, the medical stuff, because I also think that's interesting. I mean, I did that for like almost 20 years. So uh, I think um, we're not gonna lose it, we're just gonna shift the focus, the emphasis a little bit. But I guess we'll see. As far as that uh, critical collapse So, you know, like, are we worried about the end of humanity kind of thing? Is that, is that, you know, I, I would say the answer is no. Uh, it, um, bees have been around for maybe 200 million years, and they faced lots of problems in those uh, million years, millions of years. So I feel like as long as they have enough time, they're going to evolve through uh, any, any, real, any real problems. That may not happen on the time scale we want it to, um, but I also think there's some other pollinators uh, that can pick up the slack a little bit. Now, what's concerning is that not only are, are the honeybees dying, but then these other pollinators are clearly, because of our activities primarily, suffering from declines as well. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, it's, it's an environmental question, really. I mean, it's about, you know, conservation and trying to, uh, you know, protect, protect the environment. So, I mean, if we do that, we should be in good shape. That's one of the things, I mean, if you think about like the really extreme things, like almonds, you know, during, there's, there's only like three weeks where there's anything for pollinators to eat in that area. And it's only when those three weeks when, when the almonds are flowering. And the rest of the year, there's nothing to eat. So other bees just cannot live there really in any efficient way. So in areas where there's uh, lots of different diverse <coughs> flowers, I think the idea is you just are concerned that the people are gonna bring lots of bees in there uh, and potentially outcompete or spread disease to these, uh, these native or wild bee species. Do you have an estimate of how big your bee colony is? 
Yeah, so, so I was just uh, up there, uh, and Lisa and I were talking about it, that, um, that we have, um, I usually go into the winter with about six colonies, and don't get 100% survival. Winter is actually really challenging for bees. So I have four colonies that came through the winter, and probably in those colonies right now, they have approximately 10 to 15,000 bees. And then uh, they're gonna keep expanding, because they've already started laying eggs for new bees. They're gonna keep expanding up until probably mid-August, or September 1 will be their maximum. And at that point, they might be up to 80,000 bees per colony. Each, per colony. So yeah, there's lots of different, uh, that's another thing we were just talking about, is how do you get bees? Um, so I've been lucky that I have pretty, pretty good sight for my bees, and uh, the bees are in good shape. So what I'll be able to do is I'll actually be able to uh, split the colonies and have them raise their own queen so that I can just expand the number. And I usually, starting with something like four, I'll probably expand up to you know around nine, and then I will give some of those away um, or sell them at cost to, uh, to get back down to, uh, to six colonies to go back into the winter. Because one of the things about an urban situation, not only should I be kind of aware of how I'm impacting the wild bees around here, because actually New York uh, City actually ha happens to have a pretty diverse wild bee uh, community, but also, uh, you know, they can kind of get on people's nerves if there's too many bees around. So, you know, this is a campus for humans, and the bees can also be here. Um, so, I kind of have to keep that in mind. Um, uh, but, yeah, you can expand them. You can actually also order bees. Um, they used to send them through the mail, and I don't think that happens as much anymore. Yeah, or not. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like, if... if I actually usually every year I put in an order for two colonies, a sort of an insurance policy, um, but there are places that raise bees specifically to sell, and so I could go pick them up there. Or you can get packages from uh, more temperate, uh, or I guess warmer regions, so like Georgia is really big, California is really big in terms of bee production for the whole country. How often are queen bees born? Because I'm assuming there's only one in each colony. Yeah, so with down. honeybees, there's only one. And, uh, uh, some of the bees, like bumblebees, there might be multiple queens in a colony, which is uh, kind of one of the differences. Is you, you see all the way down to, to individual bees or solitary bees within that, that picture, which live by themselves, all the way up to honeybees, where you just have you know, these massive colonies. And um, there's usually only one queen. And then if they decide they're going to make a new colony, then they'll make a new queen. So they'll have two for a brief period of time. Or if, um, if the queen dies, then they'll start making queens. And in those cases, they usually try to make you know, five to ten to sort of hedge their bets. But then only one ultimately makes it. But one of the cool things about them is they actually decide who's going to be the queen. So there's, they just treat the, the larva differently to make one a queen versus a worker. So it's all about what they're feeding to these, uh, to these young immature stages, yeah. So um, if there was no movement of bees and full commercialization of bees, what would happen? Because it seems like, to me, the movement of bees and having too many bees in a certain area of pollinating has shown to kind of have negative repercussions. But if there wasn't movement, would that also have negative repercussions? Yeah, I mean, I think the problem is, is that we've sort of just gone down this path, and it's hard to get out of it. Um, and arguably, the path has been actually very good for bees. Uh, you know, as as the, I mean, up until now, you know, as the, as more and more agriculture has required that you have honeybees to pollinate it, then you need more honeybees, and so it's been kind of a cycle. But now we're kind of in the extreme, and I, I don't, I don't know how easy it is to kind of back out of that uh, path that we. So I, I think it would be pretty bad. I mean, I think uh, definitely a lot of a lot of uh, farmers would would go under or would have trouble making it. So I'm not sure how to kind of spool that back. But you know, I think 
one of the things is just trying to change some, I mean, and there's lots of programs that the, the USDA is, is doing right now and lots of local initiatives to just try to change at least, at least to try to bring some of the native uh, bees back by offering uh, diverse plantings around uh, your typical, you know, primary cop or uh, crop like, um, like almonds, like, you know, just put in hedgerows of, of like more diverse flowers so that you can try to bring those, those native bees back. But I don't think that's, you know, that's not going to cut it if, if we want to really get back to, and, I, and I'm not sure that we can go back, but, uh, you know, certainly thinking about it, what we might do to improve it. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of groups that are involved in that. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of that um, for really self-interested. I mean, I like bees, um, so you know, I'm not really. But I but I think that's possible to do that. Uh, I know there's definitely a group at MIT uh, that has been working on like a very small robot that could do that. Um, you know, for me, I find that to be like, you know, there's some problems that maybe we don't need to technology our way out of. Maybe we just need to like do something simple like grow more flowers. Um, but, you know, that's my own opinion. And plus there was that Black Mirror episode. So <laughs> it turned out they were evil, the little robot bees. So, you know, it's something to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about how it's pretty much impossible to separate biology from medical field and how you're trying to change that by expanding on your lab kind of. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm experiencing that. I'm taking a bioplasm in Columbia with 99% of students at pre-med and I'm not. Uh, why do you think what you're doing or what you're going to do hasn't been done before? Why don't more introductory bioplasmists expand on the continuum of biology rather than focusing on one? Well, I mean, I would say that the other side of the course that I teach, so I teach one semester of the intro bio and the other semester does cover a lot of these these parts of the continuum. So that's taught typically by Professor Hertz in our department. That's going to cover a lot more of that biology. You know, my job is to cover the cellular stuff. And so I think we actually do have a pretty nice balance overall. Um, but I've just found that I want to change my upper level class. You know, right. and, I, and you notice I didn't say anything about the, the intro class. I'm not even going to try to change that. I mean, I think there's certain expectations uh, for what people are learning there that I don't think I can really you know, mess with. But I think you know, that's a good point. I think once you get to the upper level, there, you know, there are, you know, across the street and here, lots of different uh, biology courses that would cover the whole continuum. Can I ask a follow-up? Uh, sure. Do you think there's a benefit of, uh, in an introductory class, do you think there's a benefit to either just focusing on the medical aspect, or would it be beneficial to expand on the continuum? Do you think there's a, like one level goes to the other? Or? Well, I mean, I think it's really important anytime you're learning biology to do the whole continuum. I, like I said, I think our full year intro course does that. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I think gets back to kind of the idea of STEM education is in that intro course. Sometimes I wish I could make more connections to like real life things, whether it's medicine or sustainability. Uh, but I, I find that I feel constrained by just how much time we have and how much things we have to cover. And you know, I don't know. If, I don't think that's necessarily great. Um, one of my colleagues calls it the, the coverage monster, where you just sort of feel like trapped to cover a certain amount of things. Um, but I think that's one of the things that the lab. There's really only certain kind of ways of thinking and uh, techniques that we have to kind of think about. So how I contextualize them is, is fairly open in that upper level context. But you know, the intro, it's, I mean, I think students appreciate when they see links with real world things. You know, they just don't have that much time. I mean, everybody's getting up at, you know, eight, or at nine, 50, or 49 to leave the class. You know, everyone's giving me that extra last minute. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I read in a pop, uh, it may not be scientific, but like I, I, I read these articles and it starts around like maybe 10 years ago or something about how um, cell phone signals 
uh, or like wireless signals affect bees? Do you have any, do you do any research on that or do you have any knowledge of, because um, you're talking about sustainability, but in a, this is in a different way. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that kind of commonly comes up and I, I actually think even in the medical context, uh, you know, there's recently some stuff about cell phones and cancer and, and you know, what are the relationships there. Yeah, I'm not aware of any data that really firmly suggests that cell phones are involved in either of those problems, you know, in a really, uh, you know, we've got to be worried about it kind of way. Um, but that's just, I don't, I don't know that much. 